seat, Sophie. Good afternoon. Welcome. To All right. I'll You're gonna have to give me a microphone. All right. I'll shout for a minute. You could use my microphone. <laughs> Get me a microphone that works. Oh, look at that. Amazing, amazing. All right, good afternoon, and welcome to the afternoon sessions. Uh, I'm very, very proud, to, or at least you know, it's incredibly proud to have Sophie Wilson with me. Sophie, on the board, it says you're a microprocessor designer, which kind of buries the lead, I think, a little bit, because you've done a, something which I think... Everyone in this room has got something that you were part of the genesis of, which is an ARM processor, probably many in their home. Can you just put that into context a little bit? What is an ARM processor and why are there so many of them? So, um, well, uh, way, 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 way back in 1983, we looked for a processor to use. We couldn't find one we wanted, so we made our own. Long story short. Um, we were aiming at building a processor that was used for desktop computers, because that's what the company sold. And uh, it's it ended up as a deeply embedded processor. So at current states, there's about 130 billion ARM-powered chips in the world. Um, each chip has one or many, usually many, ARM processors in it. So there's an uncountable number of the actual processor out there. Nobody knows how many. Um, ARM has licensing such as you can use this any number of times you like on a chip. So nobody knows. Nobody knows how many have been sold, but lots. OK, so dial back to 1983. You're there. You, you've worked on a thing called the BBC Microcomputer and other things for a company called Acorn in the UK, which was very, very successful, we used an 8-bit processor and you want to make a business machine, and instead of going out and buying some other processor, you and a couple of other people think, we'll just make a processor ourselves. How does that, so why were you able to make that leap and say, yeah, actually this is viable? Um, it's, a, it's a big stretch. Uh, so the first thing we did was we were using the 6502 microprocessor, the same microprocessor that's in an Apple II. I don't think anybody's sold a BBC microcomputer for as much as an Apple II prototype sold recently. Um, so you, you obviously want to do better with your next system, move on from a 6502 to something more powerful. Now, the BBC Micro had a facility for adding a second processor to it. So this meant we could quickly um, build uh, a, a board and evaluate processors. So we looked at the best that was available from Intel, which was the 8286 at the time. Um, we looked at the best that was available from Motorola, still a functioning company that didn't make cell phones. Um, and that was the 68000. We looked at an up-and-coming processor from National Semiconductor, the NS16032 was its original name, and somewhere along the way, marketing decided that they'd rename it the NS32016, as marketing does, um, and, and so on. And we began to think to ourselves, well, these processors don't live up to the claims that are being made by Intel, Motorola, National Semiconductor, etc. cetera. Um, when we build them as, as boards, and normalize everything to our systems, because it's a second processor, everything's normalized to the same system, we can see that the performance is very much the same. If you, in fact, normalize these processors, which ran without instruction and data caches, um, to bus bandwidth, you see that their performance is actually close to identical, no matter what, wow. That's fun. <laughs> yeah, it's Fleet Week in San Francisco, so there'll be some Navy flyers doing some fancy stuff over the bay, so please carry on with... It'd be far better to watch them than me. Um, <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> so we had all these graphs saying the performance of this processor within Delta is precisely determined by its bus bandwidth. 
Now, inside the BBC Micro, we've built actually quite a fast memory system. It, it was four megatransfers per second, eight bits wide. So we knew we could design a, a, a high-speed memory system. We knew we could make a four or eight megatransfer uh, memory system, and we could make it eight, 16, 32 bits wide. So we could, we could give a lot of bus bandwidth to anything that we designed. That would be easy. Um, and all these processors couldn't make any use of it. it, it when we actually normalized the bus bandwidth against the 6502, we actually found out that even the most advanced processors that they were trying to sell us were the same. So how do we get out of that hole? Well, quite by chance, as it turns out. So Professor Andy Hopper at Cambridge University um, dumped onto my desk the very first um, research papers that were being printed out about new technology called reduced instruction set computers, RISC. Um, now, there's a popular misconception about RISC machines, um, and what's been reduced isn't the number of instructions. RISC machines frequently have loads and loads and loads of instructions. What's been reduced is the complexity of the instruction, the, the complexity of carrying out the instruction. So, RISC machines have all the instructions that you need, they just put it together in a different way than competing processors, CISC machines. So that was interesting, um, but you know, these were being made by proper research establishments who had multi-years of experience in designing stuff. You know, some of these early papers were by IBM. Um, so th th they, they sort of showed a way that one might do it, build your own processor, um, while also seeming to set the bar still formidably high. So the people who built the 6502, um, William D. Mensch in the Western Design Center, um, started to design a new processor. And we thought, well, we like the 6502 quite a lot. So we should go out and see Bill Mensch and his Western Design Center. And you know, we'd visited other places that made microprocessors before. We knew what to expect. We knew that it'd be a massive factory, and there'd be loads of people. Well, Western Design Center wasn't like that. Um, Western Design Center was on the outskirts of Phoenix, and it was a couple of bungalows with some electronic engineers, senior EEs, um, and a bunch of grad students. So the, the process that they were designing, the 65 SC816, we would go on to use but what we really came away with as a lesson was the feeling that if a couple of electronic engineers and a bunch of grad students could design microprocessors, well, maybe we could. Um, so we, we started playing fantasy instruction sets in our heads. Um, and gradually slid towards thinking, yeah, it's not a maybe. We definitely can do this thing. We can, we can design a processor. A processor is a complicated set of digital logic, but the inside of a BBC Micro, which we'd previously designed, was a complicated set of digital logic. Designing a microprocessor is all about putting together a lot of digital logic and getting it right. Hey, we could do that. Um, so we did. And, and you did it, and the first chips that were produced worked perfectly first time. How did that come about? That's a, that's a big achievement for these grad students who are doing something. What did you do to make that possible? And, and here we seem to have diverged from everybody. Um, the NS160032, 32016, um, was a, a big case in point. We still followed these processes that we'd built evaluation systems for. In fact, Charles Spork of National Semiconductor came to visit us because we were one of the people who'd put the thing together and made it work faster than anybody else. Um, so that processor, it was revision H, I think, before anything even remotely worked properly. Um, we stopped following it round about revision K, and they still hadn't got it right. So making sure that the thing we imagined was fit for purpose, validation, and making sure that the thing, the logic we'd actually implemented did what we designed it to do, verification, were two important steps that we took. Um, and you have, to, you have to do both at once. 
Um, so for validation, we had to get really sure that the processor we'd built um, ran the programs we want in the style it we'd like to do it. Um, so we did that by building instruction set simulators. So I think I spent, well, quite a lot of time writing instruction set simulators, um, written in machine code, running on the 6502, on the 32016, and other processors. Um, and those were high-speed instruction set simulators. They weren't cycle accurate. They didn't model what was going on inside the processor, but they just took the abstract architecture of ARM um, and ran those instructions. And then using those instruction set simulators, we could do two different things. We could do the validation bit, so we could write programs, write compilers, etc., that output the um, machine code of ARM and uh, make sure that this was fit for purpose, that it would do what we wanted. Um, so that was, that was one thing that went on, and we rapidly brought up compilers. We brought up BCPL, the forerunner to C. We didn't bring C up at that time, but we did bring up BCPL. Um, we brought up Lisp, BBC Basic, all, a whole bunch of stuff was, was brought up to but prove the process of works. we, this is how many people doing this? Uh, there, there were, so ARM was designed by me, Steve Ferber, Alistair Thomas, Jamie Urquhart, Robert Heaton, um, Dave Howard. Yep, right number. That's it. So um, you've got six people who have completely changed the way we're doing things because we all have ARM processors. Well, remember that the validation bit sort of flew out a, a bit further, so actually it was more like about 15 people. But yeah, that, that many people. So the second bit, the verification bit, we wrote self-testing programs. I wrote the data path uh, verification suite for the very first ARM processors. So that's a program written in ARM assembly language that self-checks itself is getting the right answer. So as it were, it's a blob of code. You run it on an ARM and it says, hey, hey, a perfectly working data path. Lovely. And other people um, wrote ones that tested the load store unit and so on. And you test each bit like that. Now, at the moment, these are just running on the instruction set simulator. Meanwhile, we write other programs. So Steve Ferber wrote um, in BBC Basic, running on a BBC computer, um, a, a register transfer level model of the ARM processor. So this is something that, um, like the instruction set simulators, uh, carries out the actions of an ARM processor, but this time it does it with high fidelity, obeying all the things that the actual logic of the processor will do. So it's time inaccurate, um, it uses all the same buses, th th there can be no mistakes I in it. So after we had all this stuff running on the high performance machines, then we'd have the um, cycle accurate uh, model of the processor carry this out. And that, that did take a lot longer than running it on the cycle accurate. So today they look like terribly low figures. So BBC micros were powered by two and four megahertz 6502s. The instruction set simulator for ARM running on one of those machines was running at 100 to 200,000 instructions per second. And that was fast enough that I could write an editor in ARM machine code and run it on the instruction set simulator and have a usefully usable editor. Um, in fact, lots of people use that out of preference to all the other editors that the company had which is quite fun. Um, so the, the RTL model of the processor is running much slower. It's running about 5 to 20, depends exactly how it's doing particular things, uh, instructions per second. So we had a farm of BBC micros, each running a part of a test program in order to get the whole volume of test programs through um, the, the cycle accurate model. Now, meanwhile, um, we'd built the processor out of transistors. So you, we use a transistor simulator to prove that the action of the transistors when running the test programs is exactly the same. Now, that thing's really slow. We were running on Apollo domain computers powered by 68,000s, and the extracted transistor model of the original ARM at 25,000 transistors is running sub one instruction per second. So 
that's really, really tiresome. So we couldn't run the entire test suite on the extractor transistors. Um, we had to run them, we had to select bits of test suites that we thought were critically important, which you do by code coverage, um, and run them on the extractor transistor model. So we had three models which we proved were identical, and the high-speed model was proved to be useful, that we were designing what we wanted. Um, now, we did that not only for the processor, but we were actually built four chips at the same time. We built a pro processor, a video controller, a memory controller, and an I.O. controller. So we built four chips, and we did the same thing for the lot of them, and everything worked. We, we, you know, you could the chips would come back from the fab, we'd put them in the board, um, run BBC Basic on it if it was a processor, print pi, open the bottle of champagne, write 26th of April 1985 on the bottle of champagne to signify the milestone that the very first arm worked. And then it was an overnight success. Um, an overnight success in these terms takes 25 years. So <laughs> we didn't sell the first 10 billion arm-powered devices until 2008. So, yeah, <laughs> we, we, we're a slow burner. Um, so while ARM was captive inside Acorn, uh, only Acorn machines and a few other people who wanted to license it from its manufacturer, VLSI Technology, were using it. So we're in a world where maybe 100,000 ARM processors would ship in a year. And that's, that takes a long time to get to 130 billion like that. Um, so Acorn decided to set ARM free. Yay, free as a bird. Um, so in uh, 1990, the third time round, um, a consortium of Acorn VLSI technology and a company you might have heard of called Apple um, decided to set up and fund a company called, named after the microprocessor. The microprocessor was Acorn Risk Machine and the company is called, to this day, ARM. So nowadays, it doesn't stand for Acorn Risk Machine, it just stands for ARM, ARM Holdings. So that's kind of fun. Um, and, and what's uh, interesting about this is that you, you stop making chips and you start just licensing intellectual property, and that creates this enormous explosion in this processor. So uh, we realized we didn't know anything about actually running a chip company. We, we were engineers. Um, so we went out and we found um, a chip expert, a, a salesman from, as it happened, TI, um, called Robin Saxby, now Sir Robin Saxby. Um, and he had a brilliant idea, absolutely brilliant. Um, and just to prove it wasn't a mistake, he had another brilliant idea. Um, so the first brilliant idea was instead of this company, like a company like VSI Technology, sell chips, the company ARM would be founded and set up to sell people the rights to make chips. So it would sell intellectual property. The, the first IP licensing company. Um, so that was brilliant idea number one. Brilliant idea number two was ARM was a very small company. And it would remain, for most of its existence actually, quite a small company. Um, so if it was going to be successful, it would do it in partnership with its customers. So ARM built this world where everybody's in partnership with everybody else. You may be competitors in real life, but when you enter the hallowed doors of ARM, your friends and pals, you can entrust secrets to ARM, and ARM will keep your secrets even from your competitors. And together, you will grow a, a happier world. And that turned out to be even more brilliant than the technology, even more brilliant than the IP model. The partnership model that Robin Saxby introduced um, made ARM extremely successful, eventually. I mean, overnight success, 25 years, that level of successful. And the other thing is, this was not just a processor, right? It was a system on a chip. So this was the first SOC. How did that come about? Um, so while ARM was still inside Acorn, we designed a processor, a memory controller, a video controller, and an I.O. controller. And Acorn was all about making machines cheaper, um, making more powerful machines. A large sections of Acorn's marketplace were into education, 
those people don't really like to pay a lot for a computer. Um, and they want the computer to be powerful and to last. So you know, the, the slogan for ARM during the development of the project was MIPS for the masses. MIPS being millions of instructions per second, not any reference to the Stanford company. Um, so that kept us on the straight and narrow. Everything that we put into the process of design, how we built everything, was aimed at producing stuff that could be consumer mass marketed for Acorn's machines. So um, in 1987, the first risk powered processors were launched, home computers were launched from Acorn. And obviously, Acorn was on a treadmill all the time to produce newer, better machines. So um, we needed to then produce higher performance arms for higher top end machines and cheaper ones for lower end machines. And so what do you do? Um, for the higher end stuff, we integrate bigger, better processors with more transistors. For the lower end stuff, we take the old processor and we combine it so that wh where the first machines went out with a four chip set of an ARM, a memory controller, a video controller, an IO controller, to get cheaper, we put all those things onto one chip. And we were the first company to make a system on chip. And that was made by GC Palesi Semiconductors, who nobody's ever heard of, but they, they helped us do that. And that was partly because the actual ARM core that you created was much smaller than the other risk cores that were available, right? Yeah. So what, one of the things that kept us on track for MIPS for the masses was to build our processor not so it was the most powerful processor, not to prove a point that risk was the best way to build things, but to, to make something that we understood how to build that would be low power, high performance for its power um, and work well. Um, so we ended up only using 25,000 transistors, um, which was quite a low number at the time. Um, that's only five times, no, it's only six times more transistors than the 6502 used. So a very small processor. Similarly, because we are a small team, the memory controller, the video controller, and the I.O. controller were also small chips. So we had small, small things that we understood. We could combine them together. They were built to work as one. So we owned it all. We built it all. So we could combine it together on one piece of silicon and make the world's first SOC. And so today, if I take out my iPhone and drop it in acid or something, and there's the ARM core exposed, would you recognize any of what's in there as something you worked on in 83? Is there anything left that needs to be perhaps removed now? Well, um, so Apple are a very special case. If you took out your iPhone, um, ARM has different sorts of licensing. So we can li license somebody like Qualcomm um, an ARM core designed by ARM. So Qualcomm um, use cores with imaginative names like Cortex-A75. Um, their marketing people don't like that, so they rename that core Cryo-260 or Cryo-280, depending on exactly what they've done with it. Um, but Apple are in a special case. I mean, they were an original investor in ARM, um, and they demanded stuff that was made custom for them. ARM can't really afford to make too much fully custom for people. So it introduced, somewhat later than Robin Zaxby's first two in inventions, it introduced an even more ethereal license than licensing IP. Apple has the right to build processors um, that execute the ARM instruction set. And that's, that's a, an architecture license. It just has the license to make ARM architecture machines. It doesn't get anything directly from ARM apart from help and test programs and, and advice and compilers and all that sort of thing. But so, so if you took your uh, A12 Bionic out of your iPhone, um, whatever the number is, XS, 10S, um, then the, the A12 designed on a seven nanometer processor contains no ARM IP. Um, in fact, it also contains no imagination technology IP. Um, Imagination Technology, another UK company, provided Apple with its GPUs for a very long time, but Apple have now sort of expanded out from designing processors. Um, 
So if I look at the Apple A12 Bionic chip, um, I can see mm, clusters of stuff. I can see where the big cores are. Apple's big core is called Vortex in the uh, A12 Bionic. Um, the Vortex processor is probably the most complex implementation of a microprocessor architecture currently being mass marketed on the planet. Um, everybody thinks it's Intel it, or, or IBM with their power series, but as far as we can tell, and Apple aren't telling anybody, um, then the Vortex processor does more work per cycle, more power efficiently than anything else that currently exists, um, which is quite amusing. Um, there's also an Apple-designed processor called Tempest in there. Tempest is a little core as opposed to a big core. One of, one of ARM's inventions over the years has been the idea that you have big cores that are not particularly power efficient, um, that go very fast, um, and little cores that are very power efficient but go quite slowly, and the operating sw system swaps tasks between the two of them, and the two execute exactly the same architecture so programs can't tell where they're running. So a Apple have not only designed their own superlative big core, they now, in the thing called Tempest, have a little core. They've only been designing little cores for a while. The previous effort was called Mistral. Um, so in 83, you and a very small team of people make this thing that has this you know, wide-ranging effect over 25, 30 years' time. Who is the equivalent team today, and what are they doing that we should be looking at, that I can invest in as well, if you... <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult, isn't it? Because by its very nature, um, you don't know. Um, we, we designed ARM in total secret. Um, when we put out the first press releases about ARM, journalists would return them saying, that can't be true because I'd have heard about it. Um, th there are small companies working today on innovative projects, without doubt, um, but identify wh which of them is going to have an overnight success that takes 25 years is very hard. You could look at somebody like Mill Computing, um, in the Silicon Valley for ideas on how to build a processor with a more modern hat on um, and take, take your chance. But you will have to wait 25 years before you get your money out. I'm willing. I'm willing to wait 25 years. I need a retirement plan. So, all right. So we're almost at the end of time, but I want to give the audience a chance to ask at least one question because this has been utterly fascinating. There's a question right down here at the front. So at some point, Apple decided to use PowerPC for the desktop machines. Was ARM ready at that point? Was there a competition between PowerPC, you know, in, this, in the transition from 68K to PowerPC? I assume they evaluated ARM, or was it just not ready at the time? It just wasn't ready to be in the Apple desktop machines and PowerPC. Power, PowerPC, in, um, IBM and Motorola put an awful lot of effort uh, early on into making high-end implementations. With ARM, we started at the low-end implementations and built up. So it went into Newton. Newton message pad was Apple's use of ARM, and then Steve Jobs killed it. And the power efficiency of ARM is its compelling advantage at this point. Did you design for that? Was that intentional? That was intentional. Um, we didn't know how well we'd done because modeling tools for power efficiency weren't very good. Um, what we did know was when we put the first chip into the socket and booted it up and it all worked happily and we opened the champagne, um, later on we went back and looked at the board and the power supply line to the chip was broken. There, there was no power going to the chip. So the ARM processor was in there and it was working, but it was working on parasitic power that it was stealing from the chips surrounding it. All right, we're going to have to stop because of the time, but there are two things I want to thank you for. First of all, thank you for flying all here, the way here for one day to do this. You must be absolutely exhausted in telling us about this. But also, I wanted to personally thank you. The BBC Micro was the first machine I ever ha owned. My parents could barely afford it and somehow scrabbled the money together, which caused me to end up sitting here with you talking about the BBC Micro. So thank you for building that all that time ago, and thank you so much for being with us today. <laughs>